about real quick. Uh, thanks first and foremost uh, for tuning in today, for jumping on Facebook with us and, uh, and checking out our uh, Facebook Live, or as we coined it this morning, our jam stream. And so thanks for being here. Thanks for checking that out, uh, for being a part of it. I just want to encourage you uh, to go to the website, www.jam.church, and, uh, and see what's going on there. Uh, you can check out the podcasts. Um, there's a place for you to fill out a, a prayer request. So uh, we want to be involved in what's going on in your life. And, and we miss you and we wish you were here in the building with us. But until we can do that again, please continue to give us the opportunity uh, to pray for you. So even if you're not a member of Jesus Alive Ministries, if you don't attend church here, you can still go to that website and fill out that prayer request card and know that the men and women of God, people that love you, are still praying for you. Uh, it just looks a little bit different than it did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the other thing uh, that you can do there on the website uh, with the podcast and the prayer is also you can still support the church. So you, we have the ability for you up in that top right corner to hit the give button, and that'll take you to our, uh, our giving page. And so let me say thank you to all of those of you who are being faithful through this and continuing uh, to, uh, to support the church and the, the mission of Jesus Alive Ministries to reach, love, and lead here in our community. And um, this is actually the time in the service where I would come up and, and talk about how at JAM we believe that giving is an act of worship. And you can still worship through giving even though you're at home. So you can download the Tithely app uh, and do it from your phone. You can do it from the website. But I do want to encourage you uh, to continue to be faithful in the tithe and offering. Uh, and I know that you'll, God will bless you for that. You know that. Enough about that. And so, uh, so check out the website. See everything uh, that's going on there. The other thing uh, that I want to kind of talk to you about real quick is the fact that, that we've been fasting for the last week. Uh, last Sunday, uh, we said that we would start fasting after service and that we would break that fast together tonight during our worship service. Well, we're not having a worship service tonight. The plan was during that worship service to do communion and use that as, as our kind of our marking point for the end of the, the seven-day fast. And so we're going to do communion today. And so this gives you, this is kind of your heads up. Uh, go to the kitchen during the worship time. Um, if you have juice, that's great. You can use water. I don't want to get hung up on those, those little details. Um, I believe that God will honor our desire to still be in a community together as we, as we take communion. So I will lead us in communion at the end of the service and so you can, like I said, go to the kitchen. If you've got crackers, wheat thins, a slice of bread, a cup of water, I don't really think that that matters so much uh, because, A, just 
things are different right now. But I do believe that God will honor, and, and what a wonderful thing uh, for me anyway, I'm, I, as I think about families at home gathering together to take communion. And so super excited about it. So you've got probably about the next 25 or 30 minutes with these guys to, uh, to get those things ready. And at the end of service, uh, I'll lead us in communion. And then lastly, our Easter service. We are tr- working hard to come up with something kind of out of the box, just thinking outside of the box. So stay tuned. Uh, check out the website. Check out um, our Facebook page. Uh, I will have an update, hopefully here in the next couple of days, of exactly what it is that we're going to do on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, but we want you to be a part of it. So like I said, we're, we're thinking outside the box here a little bit. And, uh, and so uh, just be looking for those announcements and for that update and, um, and now let's just uh, go to the Lord in prayer and, uh, and then get back into a time of worship and, and, and take this opportunity at home there to make your living room, wherever it is that you are that you're watching this morning, and make it a place of prayer and make it a place of worship. See, wherever we go um, is the body of Christ because the, the church isn't the building. The church is us. So, so have church this morning right there in your home. Father, we just thank you. God, we are so grateful that you've given us this opportunity, Lord, to still meet together, to still be the church. Even though we can't do it maybe the way we would want to and we, we miss that interaction with one another and maybe, God, that'll, that'll stir our hearts uh, to do a better job of being in community together when this is all over. But, God, until then, help us to be diligent and faithful to the opportunity that we have now. Help us, God to make that that personal space where we are a place of worship. Because you, God, are still worthy of worship, whether we're at home or together in a building. So God, bless our service, our time together. Bless your word today, God, that it would would find a place in our hearts and that that it would change us, that we would be molded and shaped into the image of Christ, that we would rise up and be the church. So Father God, thank you. Thank you, God. Bless our time. Bless this, this jam online. And, uh, and God, I just pray that you would be glorified in it and through it all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
two things, your goodness and your sovereignty, they come hand in hand. And whatever circumstance, God, that we are feeling, whatever obstacle that we have to endure, whatever thorn is in our sides, God, we trust that in you. We trust in your sovereignty and your goodness, even when I don't understand even when I'm struggling to hear your voice. God, help us, Lord, to trust you in your sovereignty that no matter what we face, what we've gone through, that you are good and you are faithful to your people. And even though I can't physically see it, you're working behind the scenes for our good. Even though I can't understand my circumstance, God, you are here. 
working through it all. And we will see the fruition of your faithfulness in our lives, in our hearts. So help us, Lord, glorify your name. Worship you from the depths of our hearts.
depths of your heart be my everything be my together for good to them that love you and maybe God that even in this in this uncertain times and everything this just the insanity God maybe this is a bit of a reset to help your church to be reminded that in spite of everything else that you and you alone are our everything our everything God so help us God to press in to that press into it, Lord. God, that our faith would, would grow now more than ever. God, that our hope that, that, that we would rest, as Dre has said, in, the, in your sovereignty. That before the foundations of the earth were laid, you knew that today would be here. Not just in, in this Thing that's going on in the world, God, but in our individual lives, you knew, you knew, God, what we'd face. You knew, God, what we'd have to endure, and, and, and you knew the path that would be laid out before us, and so, God, we have to learn to rest in your sovereignty that we might respond to adversity in a way that brings glory to your name. And so that's our, that's our hope and that's our prayer, that's our desire today in this place as we step into your word, God. So, so give us ears to hear it today, Lord. Give us hearts open and willing uh, and, and a desire, God, birth within us, the desire to not just be hearers of the word, but to let it get down inside and then produce fruit for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God, praise God, praise the Lord. So uh, so let me just start by saying again, welcome to Jesus Alive Ministries. I want to welcome all of our visitors uh, out there in Facebook and, and YouTube uh, and just say thanks for, uh, for tuning in this morning and, and choosing uh, to have service with us. And so uh, God bless you for that. And so we love you, we thank you, uh, and we just want to say here, uh, real quick, I want to remind you that at the end of the service, we're going to be taking communion together. So, so at some point, you're going to want to make that quick trip to the, uh, to the kitchen and, uh, and get uh, the crackers or bread or whatever it is that you're going to use 
um, to, uh, for those elements of communion. And again, please <clears throat> don't get hung up on the don't get hung up on the on the oh I only have water or I don't have the right kind of juice or bread. Let's let's just kind of push that off to the side because it's it's not about those things as much as it about uh, the uh, the God that we honor, the Christ and the sacrifice that we remember. And so um, so it's okay, it's okay. I promise nothing bad's gonna happen uh, if you're using. Um, if you're using bread and, and water uh, as opposed to unleavened bread and, uh, and wine or juice, okay? So, uh, so we will be doing that at the end of service. So today, I want to talk um, about adversity, but here's what I don't want to do. I'll be honest with you. I'm tired of talking about this pandemic. I'm tired of hearing about it. Uh, I'm just kind of tired of it. Now, I'm not saying it's not real because it is. It's, it's a big deal. And so we're, we are doing our our um, the right things and the social distancing and, and being as faithful as we can. Uh, and then we're just believing God for the rest. We're believing God and his, and his sovereignty to protect. And so, uh, but I don't just want to talk about that because life has, is, has shrunk down here uh, all over the world, shrunk down to one thing. It's shrunk down to COVID-19 and, and what does it mean? And I realize it's a big deal, but gosh, there's other things going on in our lives. And, and as I was praying a second ago, I, I believe that followers of Christ should be living in a way that when adversity comes, we're still able to give glory to God. And, and whether that adversity is COVID-19 and this pandemic, or if that adversity is that child of yours that's just lost, they're lost, they're, they're, they're out doing things that you didn't raise them to do, or, or maybe it's that your marriage that's holding on by a thread, if even that. There's other things that go on in the life of a believer. It's just part of the plan, to be honest. The adversity is not always there to just destroy us. The adversity is God's way a lot of times of building us up. It's like going to the gym and lifting weights. You have to tear down the muscle a little bit so that it can come back stronger. Not that I'm doing a, going to the gym a lot lately, but, but you understand what I'm saying? So we understand those principles in the natural realm, and now we want to take those things that we know to be true in the natural realm and bring them into the spiritual realm and understand that if all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose, if that's true, then that means in his sovereignty, your adversity is going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So the scriptures that we're going to be camped out in today is Psalm 23. Super familiar uh, verses of scripture. We use this scripture a lot, especially at funerals and, and things like that. Or you'll hear people quote just verse 4. We love to quote verse 4. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And you're like, bro, your team lost the Super Bowl. It'll be okay, you know. We love to quote that verse. But, but what I want to do is kind of take it in context. We're going to take the first three verses. And we're going to talk about what is David saying here. And then we're going to jump past verse 4 down to verses 5 and 6 uh, and see what happens when we get the first three. When the first three are happening, the last two are the overflow of that. And then we're going to jump back to verse 4 and understand that when all of this is working together, it makes verse 4 possible. Okay? So that's, that's kind of the plan today. So if you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and turn to Psalm 23. I will be using ESV today. That's the, the version that we typically use here. Um, it's not that different from the New King James. Um, of course, very different from the, from the King James, just in the style of language. But, uh, but anyway, whatever version you have will be just fine. Many of you know this. You could quote it off the top of your head, but let's go ahead and turn to Psalm 23, and here's why, and this is okay too, if you're out there at home flipping there to Psalm 23, get you a highlighter, a pencil, a pen, it's okay to write in your Bible, it is, I promise, because uh, along the way, when we get into this, I'm going to ask you to underline some stuff. I, I want you to be able to go back and read this later on and be reminded of some things, and so um, I'll tell you about that here in a minute, but let's go ahead, jump in. Psalm 23, beginning in verse 1, says this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me 
lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup, it overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. I pray, God, that, that this word, even though we know it, God, would just get down deep in us today and, and just cause, uh, just cause a, 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 a burning, Lord, in us for you and for your word, God, and for the truth of it, for the promises found in it. For all of this, we just ask for your help in, 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 in the name of Jesus. Amen. So here, here's the deal. At the end of verse 3, it says this, for his namesake. So I want to start with by saying this, that it's all about the glory of God. And you say, what is? Everything. All of it. All of it. All of it? All of it. Everything. Well, everything. That, that the earth spins on its axis, hurtling through space at 65,000 miles an hour for the glory of God. It rotates around the sun, the universe, all of it, all of it for the glory of God. Everything, everything, us. Uh, the, the lives that we live, and the sooner we understand that, that the lives that we're called to live, the, the, the lives that, that, that we have here should be working to that end for the glory of God. So there's three words I want to pull out, three things that David writes here in Psalm 23 that I want to kind of pull out and, and talk about as we work through this. And so if we go back to Psalm 23, verse 1, it says this, The Lord is my shepherd... So underline that word in your Bible. Take a second and underline the word shepherd there. It says, I shall not want. That just simply means I lack nothing. If he's my shepherd, I lack nothing that he wants me to have or knows that I need. Some of the things that we would go, oh yeah, but what about this? Well, he might know better than you. There have been lots of times in my life where I've prayed for something and I'm like, oh God. And it was later on that I'm like, oh, thank you God for not answering that one. Because he knows. But everything that I have ever needed, needed, I have had. Because his word says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. There's never been a time. So when he's my shepherd, I lack nothing. But here's the thing about that word shepherd. It, it, it denotes, it talks about something. David is saying, he's, 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 he's making a declaration of who or whom he belongs to. Who does he belong to? The Lord is my shepherd. See, the question that, that first we have to answer in kind of walking through this is the very first line. Can we say that? The, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord talks about ownership. Who, who's, who's am I? See, salvation is found in Jesus Christ, and at the heart of salvation is repentance and faith. The Bible doesn't say believe and be saved. It says repent. Repent and be saved. See, we don't have a belief problem. If you were to go out right now in Facebook land and then all around the world, if I were to say, oh, do you believe? Everybody believes. It's the repentance piece that we're struggling with. And to, to repent just simply means to, to turn from one thing to have another. It's, it's a change in the way that I look and think about things that then changes the way that I live. It's the way that I process. It's the, it's the lens I see the world through. Repentance says I'm done with the way that I once was, that I might be who God's calling me to be. It's to let go that I might embrace Letting go of the things that are far from God, that I might embrace the things that are God. But that's only found in Jesus Christ. 
There is no salvation anywhere else. And when we talk about ownership, see, it's the acknowledging of sin and rebellion toward God and turning from that and acknowledging Jesus as king, supreme in authority. That's where he becomes the Lord, my shepherd. It's in that that he becomes what David calls my shepherd. Second thing I want to point to. In verse 2, it says, he makes me to lie down in green pasture and he leads me. He leads me. Well, well that's talking about obedience. It's talking about obedience. Are you willing to be led? See, it's, it's one thing, and you can say, the Lord is my shepherd, but how does that play out in the life that you live? Are you, are you willing to be led? Are you willing to be obedient? It, it's out of the recognition of him as Lord that causes our hearts to become leadable. We hand over the reins. We submit to the Lord's leading. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles. Flip over to the New Testament there uh, to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Says this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You're not your own. For you were bought with a price, period. You were bought with a price, period. So, this being true, I was bought with a price. I'm not my own. So, glorify God in your body. It's, it's, we're going to get into this here in a second. It's, it's got to become a thing that, that we're living out now and not this thing in the future. That the glory of God being seen in our lives is not talking about heaven someday. Talking about the life we live now. That he leads us. That we're, that we're following the leading of the Holy Spirit. That we're praying for the leading of the Holy Spirit. He's my shepherd. God, my shepherd who leads me. And then number three, in verse three, it says this. He restores my soul. He leads me. Again, this leads me in paths of righteousness. Underline that in your Bible. So far, you've underlined shepherd. He's your shepherd. He's who you, you belong to him. He purchased you with his own blood on the cross. He leads you. The reason I want you to underline that in verse two and verse three that leads me because sometimes we need to be reminded that we need to be led. And then I want you to underline paths of righteousness. Paths of righteousness. What does that even mean? What does paths of righteousness mean? It simply means this. Godly character. Godly character. You could write that in the margin of your Bible if you wanted to. He, paths of righteousness is what? What does that mean? I mean, I'm going to walk righteously. I'm going to walk with the character of God. See, he's set it out for us. He said it looks like this. Go read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 if you want to know what it looks like. It is the, the path of a person who is living kingdom-minded. I'm not waiting some day. I'm living it now. Paths of righteousness. Turn with me to Romans. So you're there in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. You're just going to keep going right there a little bit further to Romans. And Romans 6, 1 through 4, says this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound by no means. The King James actually says, God forbid. 
By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism unto death. Take your Bible and underline this. In order that. I love it when they do that in the scripture. I love it when scripture actually tells us, here's the why behind what you just read. You just read this, right? You just read that, that, hey, we're dead to sin, that we're in Christ. We cannot continue in sin and just expect expect that the blood of Jesus is just going to be applied every time we want to do wrong and commit sin. So he gives us that in order that, in order that. This is why. The why behind what we just read is this. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Underline that, highlight it, put stars around it, dog ear the top page of your Bible. This is all about, see if the glory of God is being seen in our lives, we're going to walk in this newness of life. So godly character leads to newness of life. So let's tie everything together that we just learned in the first three verses, okay? And it looks like this. My shepherd ownership leads me obedience in paths of righteousness, new creation. Let me say it again. My shepherd ownership leads me obedience, my obedience to him in paths of righteousness, new creation. When we walk in newness of life, our lives cannot help but bring glory to God, which is what we were created to do in the first place. And just think about it. We, we recite this. We've memorized this scripture. We've memorized Psalm 23, but never got into it to find out what all the moving pieces are about. So you guys know, any of you out there who, who know me, know that I love the if this, then this, right? If this is happening, then this is the outflow. If verses 1 through 3 are happening, ownership, obedience, new life, being lived daily, that's happening. If 1 through 3 are happening, then 5 and 6 are the natural outflow, the manifestation of God's faithfulness in our lives. So when we are obedient to him, see the Bible says in Jeremiah 1.12 uh, that he is watching over his word to perform and he made a promise. I'm watching over my word because I want to perform it. He didn't just say things. He didn't just throw out promises there that he has no intention on keeping and fulfilling Quite the opposite. The Bible says that he's watching over his word so that he might perform it in the lives of those whose heart is steadfast toward him. I want the Lord watching over his word and I want him, I want him to say, Davis gets it. I want him to see me walking in obedience in new life, and new creation, glorifying him. And I want him in heaven looking at that and saying, hey, this promise, that's for him. That's my son down there. That's one of mine. But we've got to get this whole shepherd, obedient, new life thing. We've got to get that. We've got to, we've got to nail that thing down. So then we can walk into verses 5 and 6. So go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 23. Back to Psalm 23. Beginning in verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Three things I want to pull out of those two verses. Verse 5, 
You prepare a table before me is, is speaking of provision. But not just any provision. I'm talking about supernatural, that don't make sense provision. I'm talking about the kind of provision that when the world shuts down, my phone still rings and somebody says, I need software and hardware. I don't care about any of this other stuff. How soon can you get here? I'm talking about the kind of provision that you walked up to the, to the refrigerator, opened the door, took a peek and said, honey, we're out of milk. And somebody knocked on the door and said, hey, we bought too much milk. You need some? I'm talking about supernatural. God has got this in his sovereignty provision. I will set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. That doesn't even make sense, Sam. It doesn't make sense. But that, that is what we're talking about. That is God watching over his word to perform it in the life of those whose heart is steadfast towards him. Is your heart steadfast this morning? It's not just any kind of provision. It's look what God did provision. Look at the faithfulness of God. I don't know why everybody got laid off but me. I do. I don't know why this happened and this door opened immediately. I do. Prepares a table before me provision. He anoints. You anoint my head with oil. That... I believe, is the promise of the Holy Spirit. When we see these words of anointing in the Old Testament, as David most of the time is, is speaking of these types of things, he's talking about something he doesn't quite understand yet. But in the providence and sovereignty of God, he penned this one day, sat down, and he looked at all the goodness of God. And he said, he anoints my head with oil. The manifestation of God's faithfulness in our lives includes the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. That the promise of the Spirit, Jesus said, I promise, I'm sending him, the comforter, the helper, to lead and guide you. It takes us back to the earlier verses. That that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do, wants to do. That he anoints us with his precious Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11. We'll flip back over to Romans. Chapter 8, verse 11 says this. If, hopefully we settled that, right? With a shepherd talk. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also, get that pen out, get that highlighter out, you're going to want to underline this, will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That's not a down-the-road someday promise. That's a right now living with the Holy Spirit in us, empowering us to new life. Same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The Holy Spirit is working and wanting desires to be a part of your daily life. I've said this for years. God wants to be involved in the most mundane aspects of your life. He wants to be involved in everything, the big things and the little things. There are times where, where I just feel like I'm supposed to take a different route to get to work only to find out later that because there was an accident out of the AC&T again. 
God wants to be involved in all the little things, those little decisions that you make. You just feel like I'm supposed to do it this way to find out later that that was the right thing. He wants to be involved in everything. And then David is saying, look, when, because the first three are happening in my life, I'm submitted and surrendered and I'm obedient. I'm walking in this new life. This is happening, that he's anoints my head with oil. He's given me a Holy Spirit to lead and guide me through the difficult times, through the good times, through all times. Let's go back to the 23rd Psalm, verse 6. He prepares a table before me. He anoints our head with oil. And then thirdly, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David starts the verse off. David uses the word surely as if to say, all my hope is, is hanging on this nail right here. Surely being Verses 1, 2, and 3, and 4, and 5, and 6 being true. Surely, surely, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Eternal fellowship with Christ. So now let's bring all of this together. All of it. Verses 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. When I make Jesus shepherd, ownership, he leads me in my obedience in paths of righteousness, new creation, opening the windows of provision in my life and filling me with the Holy Spirit and giving me the assurance of eternal life with Him. That is amazing. That's what this life is to be about. And so... Unfortunately, that's where a lot of Christians stop. All blessing, all good, and no adversity. But you and I know that that's just not the reality. The reality is uh, times get hard. Things don't always go according to, to plan, at least not ours anyway. Adversity is just part of it. But see, if, if verses 1 through 3 are giving life, right, God's, God's faithfulness in our lives, verses 5 and 6, makes verse 4 possible. And verse 4 says this, even though, so he just read all this stuff, right, the goodness of God, everything that, that the Lord, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul, all of those things, even though, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though, so not, this is, doesn't make this not true, doesn't nullify verses one through three, even though. Even though my, my marriage is falling apart, even though I don't understand why my kids are doing what they're doing and, and how they're what's going on there, even though, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So we're going to split this into two pieces. Number one is this, the reality of adversity. There's going to be difficult times. The reality of adversity uh, in the Christian life, it just happens. And, and those people, good people, well-meaning people who made you promises that said, hey, if you give your life to Jesus, everything gets better and, and you're never going to have another problem, we're wrong. They were wrong. I can remember people telling me that, oh, you come to Christ, all your problems are over. No, they're not. I just now have the tools to deal with it. It just no longer it throws me into a funk. It no longer destroys my life. It no longer puts me on the curb. Because of who I am in Christ, because verses 1 through 3 are true. 
So Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me, shepherd, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. I mean, Jesus isn't pulling any punches here. He didn't even dance around it. He didn't even be like, eh. It's like in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy that perilous times would come. I, I don't know about you, but I, I mean, flip on the news for a minute. Perilous times might, might be here. The issue in the Christian life is not, will you have to deal with adversity? That's not, that's not even the question. The question that we started with today is this. How will you respond to it when it comes? Chuck Schwindel said, uh, life is uh, 10% adversity and 90% how you deal with it. Something like that. that may have been, sorry, Chuck, if I murdered that, but that's pretty close. See, the question becomes, will you deal with disappointment and heartbreak by clinging to the Savior? By clinging to what you know about Jesus? Or by turning and walking away into something else that is far from Jesus? Will you deal with fear and anxiety by trusting your Heavenly Father and actually using that as an opportunity to press into Him? To press into faith or Will you allow it to cause you to hide under the bed and stockpile toilet paper? Will you deal with the things that come your way in life? Will you deal with those things by by getting angry and blaming God for it? And running away from faith? See, in the 23rd Psalm, I I believe that the shadow of death, this, this language of shadow of death, It's not about physical death. That's the least, the least of our concern, physical death. Because the death that's far worse than that is spiritual death. Being completely and forever separated from God. That is the thing that keeps pastors up at night. Is that there are men and women out there who are afraid of the wrong death that maybe you're afraid of the wrong death. That there is a spiritual death where you are just completely separated from God. Trust me. Hear me, please. Your adversity and trial, your difficulties are playing a meaningful role in your walk of faith. They are. They're playing a meaningful role. Adversity is a part of life. But but how we respond to that adversity determines the course of that life. The second thing as the worship team comes back up. I want to ask the question, how how are you responding to adversity? See, David understood it. It's a part of life. Hey, God's great. My shepherd leads me, loves me, cares for me, takes care of me, does all of these things. It's amazing. He does that. Even though... I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Even though there are times in my life where I feel like it can't get any worse than this, that this is the worst thing I've ever been through until the next thing happens. But there are times in our lives where the way that we respond to what's going on is going to make all the difference. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And here is the hinge pin, the hinge pin that this truth hangs on. Your ability to, in trial and in difficulty, your ability to be able to deal with it hinges on, for you are with me. 
you're with me. That, that his promise to never leave us or forsake us is true. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, the word rod there is used to describe a weapon. It's a club. It's a defensive weapon. And the staff is used to guide and reach out to the sheep if they begin to stray into danger. So, so that staff, we know what that shepherd's staff looks like, you know, with a little hook on the top. It was designed for that reason, to be able to reach out when that sheep begin to wander and grab them and pull them back in. Hey, you're not getting away from me. Do you hear that? Do you hear what our shepherd's saying? You're not getting away from me. I'm not just going to let you wander off. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to do everything I can to keep you from doing that. I don't know about you, but that comforts me. And my shepherd is armed and ready to protect me and loving and ready to pull me back in. It's, it's why I love the, the words to the song, Come thy, Thou Fount. The words of that song are just so honest. It goes like this, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. So here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. That's just honest. It's honest. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. But I am so glad that my shepherd, my savior, reaches out and says, no, no, Davis. When I begin to stray and, no, 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 come on, come on back. That the Holy Spirit that he's anointed me with is saying, hey, conviction. So here are my closing thoughts. Adversity looks different in every life. The valley of the shadow of death is different for all of us. But we have something in common. And that is our great shepherd. So what are you dealing with? What are you, what are you dealing with? I, I don't know, but I, I could tell you what's going on in my own life. tell you that there's uncertainty that creeps in in my life that sometimes I want to just sit in a dark room with my head in my hands and go what are you doing God what's going on in your life what is it that you're that you're dealing with What's the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message this morning? What's he saying to you? See, I believe that he is always speaking. And so what if we took a moment, what if we took a moment and asked him, what if you right now at home, what if you made an altar right there in your living room. What, what if, mom, you, you took the hand of your, your daughter, daughters, sons, whatever, whoever there is, what, what if you made an altar right there in your home? What if that coffee table became an altar? Maybe it's the couch. Just make an altar wherever you are. You don't have to be in church and have a fancy one. Make an altar right there in your home and ask the Holy Spirit, hey, Holy Spirit, how are you speaking to, to our home today? 
in the way maybe that we respond to adversity and difficulty. Maybe even more importantly, maybe your prayer would be this. Lord, you need to become shepherd. You need to become shepherd. I'm tired of doing it my way. I'm tired of of what I've made this. I need a shepherd. I need, I need you to lead me. God, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do this the way that Pastor Randy's talking about, if it's gonna look like that, then I'm gonna need your help. Look, the truth of the matter is everyone, everyone who has ever come to Christ has started right there. Jesus, come be shepherd. I want to be yours. Make that altar at home. While the worship team sings and go ahead and get your elements for communion ready. Let's take a few minutes. Let's pray. Prayerfully get your elements of communion ready and I'll be back in a minute and we'll take communion together. But here for the next couple of minutes, let's just worship and let's press into this moment and see what God does. Corinthians 11, uh, 23 through 26 reads like this. For I received from the Lord 
when I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So so let's do that together. Let's pray over the bread. Take your, your, your bread, cracker, whatever you have there available to you, and let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. That you were willing to suffer a horrible death that we might live. Your broken body for our healing. God, especially in times like this, we need to remember and press into the fact that you, Jesus, the Son of God, has taken the penalty and the weight of our sin on yourself. You did it for love. Because the Father loved us. So, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Take and eat. And now the cup. (laughs) Always find it so difficult to find the right words. I mean, how how in in this humanity do I really put words to describe what this means for us? How do I even do that? How do I approach the cup that symbolizes the shed blood of the Son of God for me and for you? How do I even put that into words? So I don't even, I don't try. I just say this, Lord... Thank you. God, God, Father, thank you. Thank you. You purchased me and all those that have put their faith in your son. You purchased us. Not because we deserved it and not because we did a single thing to earn it, but because you loved us. And so thank you. That's all the words I have. Thank you. Thank you. And oh God, that you would help us to walk worthy of the sacrifice. For the glory of your name. The reason that you do everything that we read about today. For the glory of your name. Take and drink. Father God, we say thank you. We say thank you for your word today. We say thank you, God, for what it's doing in us. We say thank you, God, for the opportunity to take that word, those promises, and to walk it out. We thank you, God, for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. We thank you, God, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and in us and empowering us to walk in new life for the glory of your name, for the glory of your name, for the glory of your name, and let the church say, Amen.
even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us and we will fear no evil because you are with us. Thank you, Lord, when we were astray that you shepherded us back into your arms. God, that you've been with us this entire time. Help us, Lord, to just truly embrace all that you are as we leave and go our separate ways today. God, I pray blessings over everyone. God, that you would touch the hearts of your people, that lives would be changed, that perspectives would be changed, that we would all have our eyes opened even more to know who you are and know that you are a savior and know that you are a shepherd and know that